Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, Governor Tim Walz gives us the big picture on Minnesota's economy, and the newly elected President of the Senate, David Osmek, reflects on his new role. Plus, we remember a pivotal figure in the modernization of the Senate. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. We are in the midst of uncertain times. There are the ongoing impacts of COVID-19 and emerging variants. There's the congestion in the supply chain, which is wreaking havoc for individuals and businesses, and there's a labor shortage. But there are also some positive signs. Joining me to talk about how the state is managing these and other challenges is the governor of Minnesota, Tim Walls. Thank you for joining me. Glad to be with you, Shannon. Tax receipts so far this fiscal year are $8 billion more than was projected, 10% above projections by Minnesota management and budget, with the caveat that future foreca forecasts are just around the corner. What does this tell you about Minnesota's economy? Well, first, I think um, good decisions have been made. I think Minnesota has a long tradition of, uh, of good fiscal management. I think we have uh, mechanisms that put in place rainy day funds that we needed to use that came through. Um, but it also it speaks to, uh, to the entrepreneurship and individual businesses that they're continuing to grow. But I do think uh, it's important to note that, that that economic good news isn't necessarily equal across all groups. We know that COVID had a disproportionate impact on uh, socioeconomically challenged families. Uh, communities of color were hit harder too. But I do think it puts us in a good position, both with the recovery dollars, what the state finances are showing, um, for us to be able to look at what does a, a world after the worst of COVID look like and how do we create a, a, a continuing resilient economy. I think one of the blessings Minnesota's always had, we have a diverse economy. We have a strong ag economy. We have medical devices. We have entrepreneurship. We have a lot of Fortune 500 companies, but we have a lot of startups. That lets us make sure that we weather some of the harder times. But I do think it puts us in a good position to invest in the things that matter, especially our people, um, in a fiscally responsible manner. And, and then to make up for some of those inequities that were caused by COVID, uh, focusing on housing, workforce development, some of the things that we're hearing in all corners of the state. So speaking of future economic growth, you and a delegation of Minnesotans who represented medical technology, food and agriculture, environmental technology, and education, just recently returned from a trade visit to England and Finland. Why those two countries and what do you hope will be the fruit of this? Yeah, those two countries are important trading partners for us. They're not the biggest, obviously Canada, Mexico, we have some others, but the potential is really great. And one of the, the purposes of this is that uh, the Finns said this the same as us, that they don't do a good job of talking about what they do well. Finland ranks first in education. They rank first in quality of life, many of those things. Same way Minnesota does when you compare us against states. Um, we have the largest or the longest five-year survival rate of businesses. We have a high workforce participation rate. The purpose was to get out there and see how these folks are thinking and to build on our existing relationships. We visited the new Mayo Clinic London, um, and then we visited Upanor, which has thousands of employees here in Minnesota. And I think going out and making the case of what Minnesota has to offer to sell it, and then to hear what I was really excited about is the optimism they feel towards Minnesota and the, the commonalities. Both of those nations focused on Minnesota leaning into uh, carbon reduction, a clean energy economy, innovation around that. Um, those things entice them. So we, for example, spoke with uh, battery manufacturers who know that we're moving towards towards uh, you know, more of electrification in our transportation system. But then speaking to higher ed of saying, you know, Minnesota's innovation, whether it came agriculture-wise, uh, medical device, uh, 3M, companies that they know started in our universities, they're interesting in partnership. And we saw last week, uh, St. Cloud State has already solidified some of those relationships. So it's a positive. And does the, the, the Brexit thing with the United Kingdom, does that pose actually even greater opportunity for Absolutely. Minnesota? Absolutely. Absolutely. And they, they wouldn't. It was really interesting. There were those who were opposed to Brexit and those who were for it, but both understood that now they needed to go out and work. And, and I think there's a, there's a pending trade deal between the United States, a, a bilateral between the United States and Britain. But what they're realizing is those are hard. They take a long time. And just to be candid, our federal politics is, is pretty difficult to move things. So they're looking at state by state. We obviously can't do everything, but there are things that we can do in that. So we received a really uh, positive reception there. I think, you know, again, I stood and the companies that were there stood on the shoulders of giants or were giants. When you 
take Hormel and Mayo Clinic um, and the University of Minnesota into a space, people know of that globally, um, but to see the startups that surrounded them. So I, I agree with you, and that's one of the reasons we targeted the UK, because they came to us. Um, both of these countries came to us very interested in what we're doing, very interested in working together. This coming legislative session is an even year, which is a bonding year, and conversations are already happening about a Minnesota bonding bill. President Joe Biden just signed a $1 trillion infrastructure package, of which I think uh, $6.8 billion will come to the state of Minnesota. So what needs to happen for our state to leverage those dollars to the best of our ability? And is this a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to really upgrade Minnesota's infrastructure? Um, I, I think it may be. I would hope there'll be more to come. We have Build Back Betters on the horizon potentially, but, but I think in my experience on this, uh, I spent about a dozen years on the, the Transportation Committee in the U.S. Congress, worked with you know, late Jim Oberstar, and this was a dream for so many of us, and I would argue a bipartisan dream of infrastructure. One of the things is no matter where you're at on the political spectrum, investments in road bridges and transportation, water infrastructure is a pretty popular thing. Uh, this is huge, and what it allows Minnesota to do is, is to leverage those federal dollars. We'll need to be partners with them. A lot of times there's matching dollars that go with this, but we've been kind of limping along in Minnesota. We have over 5,000 roads that are listed as poor, 661 bridges that are poor. Um, as you heard the president say, we have thousands of miles of lead pipe that still needs to be replaced and we don't have a connected broadband to everything now we have that capacity so instead of pulling from and robbing from the general fund we now have the leverage to be able to put in and we know that those investments in infrastructure turn around about five to one in terms of what they do for communities not to mention safety upgrading all of the things we can uh, we can do so i'm uh I, I said if I would have been in Congress, I would have viewed this vote as a top five vote of my decade in Congress about how important it was. As governor, it, it's almost stunning of what we're going to be able to do, what we'll be able to invest in. And again, I would say anytime you're doing this type of investment, these are public-private partnerships. The, the private sector will be investing. That's why we were out at uh, Dakota County to, to look at the technical college about how we're going to build the workforce because that is an issue for everyone. A lot of older folks said, I'm not going back. They're unsure about COVID. Um, but now we're starting to see these opportunities. So uh, I'm excited about it. State needs to be ready. The state did a good job last year. Bipartisan um, in our, our bonding package was local jobs was incredible. I'm going to suggest I think we get close to that number again. We're about at $2 billion. Uh, coupled with what we're seeing from the federal government, this catches us up to a point. We were about $20 billion behind what we needed to be. We have the potential between the last bonding bill, this one, and the federal money coming in um, to take over half of that. So you're talking about a decade worth of projects. And again, I think this is very personal to people. This is unwinding that mess in Duluth uh, at the Twin Ports. Uh, it's roads that people know they lost people on. When I cut the ribbon on the new four lane down in Duluth, or down in Mankato, it was a neighbor who was killed on that road that you're thinking about and talking about. So I think Minnesotans, when they start to see it, when they heard it was a $1 trillion deal, Ah, it's D.C., they're fighting, whatever. No, that's a water treatment plant in Waldorf. That's what that means. And so I'm excited about it. It's good for jobs, and we know that that type of investment pays itself back off. Now, you mentioned COVID just a moment ago because I imagine governing is a challenge in the best of times. And under your tenure as governor, you had a global pandemic come down the pike. I'd like to ask you to take a moment and reflect on that. Give yourself a grade what did you do well? What could you have done differently? And with potential variants emerging, what does that mean? Yeah, it's building the structure to deal with these. And I hear a lot of people say that, you know, you didn't, you didn't expect this or whatever. Well, leadership requires you to, to play the cards you're dealt and to do it in a way that first and foremost, the protection of the people of Minnesota, and then to, uh, to triage what, you're, what are you protecting, life, then you're protecting hospital capacity, protecting economic growth. Um, as a teacher, I know it's, uh, it's dangerous and you should never give a grade before the assignment's done. This is not done. Um, but I do think that what we've seen is, is that I, I'm incredibly proud and I think this is one of the things that I came with and, and made a case to the people of Minnesota. I've built successful teams, whether it was you know, literally a team in football or whether it uh, was building teams uh, in the military or being able to work collaboratively in Congress. And I think what we did is we put a team together here who was able to respond and adapt. Uh, we still rank amongst the 10th slowest states in death rates, although it's been challenging these last month. We're, we're in the midst of the grip of the Delta variant. Um, we've also protected hospital capacity, although that's being challenged. And I think one of the things is the idea that you separated economic stability from the 
the pandemic. If you didn't deal with the pandemic, you destroy the economy. And I think of protecting that now and seeing both in terms of tax receipts, in terms of business survival rates, and seeing terms of outside groups measuring how Minnesotans did. For example, Children's Defense Fund said children in Minnesota fared better than any other state during the pandemic. I mean housing security, food security, education. So uh, I think it's too early to give that grade. Um, I, I think the principles that we adhered to and keeping Minnesotans informed. And I think amongst all else, the one thing that that I knew was my responsibility is to stand in front of Minnesotans and say, I take responsibility for this. If we're not going to get the testing done, who's responsible? Me. If we're not getting vaccines out fast enough, who's responsible? Me. And I think what that did was is it created a sense of uh, collaboration in and among state agencies to get this work done. So we got work to do yet. Minnesotans have been a big part of making this happen. I think the irony of, or, or the kind of cruelness of COVID, if you will, in this is in the midst of this grip and seeing some of our death rates, um, in speaking with the president yesterday, his team was, you know, noting and congratulating Minnesota is second in all the states in terms of boosters, number of people have boosters, which is the real fix to this. And we're top five in terms of five to 11 year olds. And I think that statistic speaks to Minnesotans of what they've done. So I think when a grade is given on this, there'll be a grade how Minnesotans did, I think state government. Um, I think probably in my position as a politician, I'll get that grade next November, and that's uh, and I respect that. In the introduction, I mentioned the labor shortage. Uh, we've been talking about a silver tsunami for some time, and it seems like it's arrived. Uh, and the state is facing a workforce shortage in many sectors, including nursing homes and in healthcare. Now, you have addressed that for the short term by activating some of the National Guard to pick up the slack in hospitals and nursing care, but what? is the possible solution for this labor shortage, both in those health sectors, but also across the broader economy? No, it's a great question, the one everybody's asking. I just came from our, our, neck, our economic expansion and inclusion you know, group of major leaders, ranging from uh, Fed Chair Kaskari down to uh, you know, Children's Defense Fund and, and entrepreneurs and, and asking this very question. And you're absolutely right. Some of this is demographics. It's hard for me to believe it. I'm the last year of the baby boomers, if you were, 1964. Uh, a lot of folks who fell in my age or a little older decided that they weren't going back into the workforce. So there was that piece of it. I'm still proud Minnesota ranks first or second in labor participation rates. But I think what we have in a lot of cases is a misalignment of, of skills. I do want to say a thank you to the National Guard who have been uh, asked to do so much. We're training about 400 of them to be CNAs. It takes about 75 uh, hours of training because there's simply not enough workforce. As we have an aging population, we have a large number of long-term care facilities. We need to get those folks in there. But that can't be the, the long-term fix. I think one of the things, first and foremost, is we need to make sure the wages are competitive in those industries, both child care and long-term care. And I think we just need to name it. The people who care for our children and care for our parents are the ones we pay the least amount of money. We value those, those two things more than anything. We need to reflect that. We need an economy that works for the long-term care providers, but also for their workers. And I think that's a conversation that's happening. It's a conversation that's happening in the private sector. If you go to chambers of commerce or if you go to businesses, and we heard this in the UK and in Finland, the number one concern on all of those workers' minds is access to affordable child care. And then second behind that is, how do I take care of my parents? And so I think it's, it's re-looking at those industries. They're broken, um, figuring out what the role of the state is and what the role of the private sector, if, if capitalistic economy can, can do it. The only thing I would say is a market failure in long-term care workers and a market failure in child care workers is catastrophic. It, it's not as if it's, we're seeing, as you're right, bottlenecks in shipping chips so that trying to buy a car takes another month. Um, that's a lot different than saying there's no one to go to work to care for your mother in the long-term care. So I think that's where the, the, the state is going to have to play a role. It's why I'm encouraging um, folks to take a look at the next piece of proposal, the Build Back Better program, is a huge investment. And those who say that, um, that child care is not infrastructure, nothing happens if there's not a place for children. Governor Tim Walls, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be with you.
A pivotal figure in the modernization and professionalization of the Minnesota Senate's operations has passed away. Here's a brief look at some of the contributions of longtime Secretary Pat Flavin. Former Secretary of the Senate Pat Flavin passed away recently at the age of 78. He had retired from the Minnesota Senate in 2009, having served as the chief parliamentarian for 36 years. During his tenure, Pat was recognized as a national leader in modernizing the legislative operations of the Senate. He led an effort to update the Mason's Manual of Legislative Procedure, and he was instrumental in bringing greater transparency to the legislative institution using online technology and television broadcasts. In 2006, he appeared before a U.S. House committee. I think in general, uh, the impact of television on this legislature has been that more citizens are aware of what's going on in the legislature and the issues before the legislature. And this has resulted in more citizen lobbying by phone and by fax and by email. And for members and the public, uh, the more we do in technology, the more we raise expectations that we can do more and produce more. And uh, consequently, there's an expectation that more and better information will always be made available. And that's, that's something that we have to face. Secretary Flavin's years of service afforded him the opportunity to work alongside many senators and staff to help professionalize the institution. During my time, there were almost 300 senators uh, close to 300, and uh, I, uh, I remember all their names and, you know, some good, not some not so good, but, and then the staff. Um, I think working with the staff, uh, all the different people, uh, there were about 3,000 employees that went through in the years that I was secretary. So, we decided that we wanted to make it more of a professional Senate staff, and that meant more full-time people because those were the people that really built up a bank of experience. Secretary Pat Flavin's career was dedicated to the Senate. His foresight helped bring greater transparency and access to the legislative process, and his contributions remain an influence in the Senate today. Senator David Osmek was first elected to the Senate in 2012 and is known as one of the more outspoken members of the Republican caucus. In mid-October, Senate Republicans elected him to serve as the next president of the Senate. I spoke with him recently and began by asking him how he's thinking about his new role. You know in life you wear many different hats and you move from hat to hat or job to job and you take different roles and responsibilities. And the responsibility of the president is to, op for the operations, he's an operations manager and professionally I was an operations, really not project manager, operations manager for a number of years for a healthcare company here in the Twin Cities. Uh, I see that as the role of making sure that you are the oil in the machine that keeps things moving and keeps things moving in the right direction. Um, me being outspoken, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm not going to have an opinion on subjects. Uh, I may, and I've, I've already started to change maybe a couple of my behaviors, uh, but yeah, I, I think more of the spicy comments that I used to say, which got the attention, and you certainly saw them, uh, they were to make a point and to make the point well. I think you're going to find that my spicy comments might be dialed back, but the passion still will be there. The president of the Senate is the parliamentarian of the body, or the oil that keeps the machinery running, as you said. And you're overseeing the business of lawmaking, making sure that procedures and rules are being followed. You have stepped into the role from time to time here and there, uh, but at this point now, are you really digging into studying parliamentary procedure? Yes, um, we, we govern ourselves based upon Masons. There's a couple of different rules of order. Robert's rules is what a lot of people know. Uh, Masons is what we at the Capitol use. And it's a book about, mm, about that thick, 
Uh, I am actually starting to read through it and have a couple of sessions with some people that are experts on Masons uh, to go through the finer points of Masons to make sure that I understand it. But like you said, I have been living under this for, you know, Masons for nine years. I understand as well as our rules and our rule book and what's called customs and usages. Um, I understand all of those roles and how they all work together to run the Senate floor as well as operate the Senate in general. And it is something where I have to be the arbiter or the decision maker to make sure that the rules are followed. And on the Senate floor, it's very important from a standard of decorum to make sure that we're, we're operating under the right rules and that we're enforcing the rules equally across, both regardless of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. And that's what I'm going to be striving for. You mentioned decorum in your statement. You said that you will strive, quote, to conduct legislative business smoothly, effectively, and with respect for the tradition and decorum of the Senate. So what aspects, in addition to following the rules of tradition and decorum, are most important? And in your view, is that in danger in part because of how much more polarized politics have become? I am a little concerned in the special session I ran the Senate floor uh, just to, to flex my muscles again to see if this is something I really wanted to do because we saw this you know, possibly happening where Senator Miller may be ascending to majority leader. Um, I, I look at the job and look at the aspects of trying to enforce equally and you saw how Senator Franzen, who I'm going to be meeting with, now she's minority leader interestingly enough, I saw how she reacted and uh, I think we have to have a better understanding of that decorum because in the house, the house guys, for lack of a better term, can wear a, a, a Speedo and eat a chicken dinner on the floor. That's the kind of decorum that we don't follow in the Senate. And it's because we've had those traditions and I, I like to look at Senator Pappas and Senator Metzen too from how they operated with a decorum to make sure that we using the decorum not as a weapon but as a mechanism so that we are all treated equally. I think that's something that uh, it doesn't have to be polarized but I think some people need to understand the, the processes of decorum that they are there for a reason is protecting not just the sanctity, or not sanctity, but the importance of the institution, but also what it means to be a senator and those traditions that are there. So it's sort of a tough one to answer, but um, I, think, I, I think I'm well prepared for this. And you mentioned the new Senate Minority Leader, Melissa Lopez Franzen. Um, you also said in your statement that it is important to you that the minority voice is heard, and she will certainly be part of that m minority voice. Why is that important? Right, and this is something, I mean, that some people will say, well, you're just mouthing words. No, that's not true. I was in the minority for four years. I understand what it's like to be in the minority and, and not be able to do what you want to do. Most times you just have your voice as the minority member. Hopefully I will work more to make sure that that voice is heard. But going back to decorum, you know, if you decide, if we're talking about that the moon is made of, uh, we have an amendment or a bill that says the, the moon is made of blue cheese. And then you want to debate that and talk about blue cheese salad dressing. And then after that, you want to talk about the comparison between blue cheese salad dressing and, thanks, and Thousand Island. Okay, these are all subject to blue cheese. But if you decide to go off the rails and start talking about orange juice, you need to start bringing that back to some point of talking about blue cheese. I know it's a simplistic way of looking at it, but I want to make sure that the, the minority, and, and when I say these things, I, as I said, I don't say them just to hear my voice. I think the minority needs to be heard because the minority sometimes has very good points that need to be listened to. Uh, not always, but sometimes. And I think I'm also the, just the right guy to do it. Uh, I'm, very, I'm a very strong person at the gavel. I run things efficiently. But I also want to be able to have everyone listen to what mo the minority says because they are Minnesotans too. Finally, you will enter the history books as the 14th person to preside over the Senate since 1972 when Minnesotans passed a constitutional amendment that removed that role from the lieutenant governor. A couple notable previous presidents, Senator Jim Metzen was known for having good friendships on both sides of the aisle. Senator Michelle Fischbach was known for her jocularity, in particular when debate got fairly tense. So 
I wonder if you've given any thought to what you maybe would like your legacy to be. Well, let's start with the the the, the end of the com the comment that you had first, the jocularity. I have a very interesting sense of humor. Uh, I think I can bring some of that to to the institution. I have from time to time, uh, especially in the case of I don't know if you remember Senator uh, Senator I think it was Senator Bach tried to in the transportation bill, and I was running the Senate at the time. He tried to have an amendment to name a road after Senator Newman. Um, I have been reminding Senator Newman that a number of times every year that we could always name a road after him. So it's, it's those types of light moments that can, actually, as Senator Fishbach did, diffuse a tense situation. Uh, it, it's, uh, as far as working across the aisle with individuals, I've learned over my nine years here, you can work with some on some issues, but maybe not on all issues. Senator Pappas, former president, um, she, uh, she and I agree strongly on the role of Israel in the, in the world, as well as uh, beer. Interesting combination. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator uh, Marty and I actually talked about a, week or about a week ago, talking about the role of the minority, and he was lead on my energy committee for a number of years. Uh, I've developed relationships with him. So, uh, Sen unfortunately, Senator Simonson is no longer with us, but I still have text messages with him. So. It's a matter of developing those relationships and having a level of respect. And I'll tell you, there are some senators that on the, on the other side that I don't work with particularly well. There's some that on my side <laughs> I don't work with particularly well. But you learn to, uh, learn to work through the system. You learn to work with the ones that you have relationships with and can agree upon. And I think what a lot of people see in, the, in any political body now, whether it's the state or the federal government, they see a lot of people screaming at each other. Well, you'll find out if you look closely, about 80% of the time, we generally agree upon a lot of things around here. My corrections bill last year was one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of these things that I think we can work together on, and I'm going to try to strive to make that happen. Our new Senate President, David Osmek, I want to thank you so much. Thanks for having me. The changing seasons provide innumerable opportunities to capture the beauty and grandeur of the Minnesota State Capitol. Take a look. again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching. <laughs>